Okay, welcome everybody. On behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, my name is Michael Morgenstern and I am an educator at the museum. And this afternoon, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Ruth Berndorf, a Holocaust survivor from the Netherlands, who will share her story with you. And afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to ask her questions. Before we begin, I just would like to share a few words about the museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that this history would never be forgotten. In the early 1960s, they were actually a minority because most people did not yet want to face this tragic history. People weren't ready to hear it. People weren't yet ready to talk about it. Thanks to their courage and their foresight, we have a museum with a mission always to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. Consequently, we are also the first and oldest Holocaust museum in the United States. Ruth Berndorf has been sharing her story at the museum for several years, and I'm honored to welcome her for her first virtual Zoom talk. Um, and this will be a very important opportunity for everybody who will be able to listen and learn from this story and ask questions. Those watching on Zoom can use the Q&A box and those watching on Facebook can type questions in the comments. Ruth, thank you so much for joining us this um, early afternoon. We're so happy to have you here and to have you as a part of our community to share your story. So we'll begin with a few questions. Can you please share with the audience um, where and when you were born? I was born in uh, Munich uh, in 1931. August 13th, I'm just two month, a month shy of 90. Thank you. And can you please talk a little bit about your family, your parents, whether you had siblings, your family history in, there in Germany? Well, I was born in Germany, but I'm Dutch. So uh, because the reason I was born in Germany is because my grandparents lived there. And my dad did a lot of traveling, so my mother wanted to be close to her mother. I have a one, I had one sibling, a six year older sister. Right now, both my parents and my sister, they're all gone. And not to, because of the Holocaust, that's just, thank God, the natural way. But uh, in 1938, I moved back to uh, Holland to, uh, and waited for our house to be finished uh, being built. And then we moved to Tilburg, which is a city in the southern part of Holland. I lived there and I went into hiding there for two years till I was liberated. And in the southern part and uh, had a long, uh, well, what I call scramble up the, uh, the hole to get out to an, an quote unquote normal life, whatever that meant. So whatever you want to know, I'll be happy to share with you. Thank you very much. So at what point did you leave Germany for the Netherlands? Can you please talk about that? Uh, we left uh, right after the uh, Kristallnacht. My grandfather lost his uh, factory and his store. And he being from Poland, he was sent uh, on the train to go be sent back to Poland. But he was uh, very fortunate. He was in the last wagon, which was not pr uh, properly attached to the rest of the train. And he felt it was slowing down and uh, then it stopped. And he quickly peeked out then he didn't see anybody around. So he jumped out of the train and walked back home. Thank you. And actually going back a little bit. So you left in, um, 1938 and you were born in 31. So you had about seven years living in Germany. What do you remember about your life in Germany and your family's life there? I have never had much of a family that I knew of. And I had a nanny for most of my life. 
uh, till I started school. And the one thing I remember mainly about Kristallnacht, not about what happened the Kristallnacht, but my mother was taking me to school the next morning and I saw the school was burning. And behind the school was a, 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 a building where the soldiers were living. And up on the second story, there were two soldiers sitting on an open windowsill, pointing at the burning school and laughing. And that's the one thing I will never forget. So that was actually, those are the main things about the, uh, the bad memories, let's put it that way. And of course, my uncles, my mother's uh, brothers went to the United States and I don't remember exactly when, I think it was in the early 38 or even 37, I don't remember. I do remember that my dad was trying to get my grandparents to come to Holland and the minister he wrote to said, no, he would not allow it because nobody has ever died in a concentration camp. Guess what? He died in a concentration camp. Well, we got my grandparents out illegally through Holland into Belgium. And they survived the, the war in Belgium. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about that, about how you got them out? Well, what, uh, the, the, what they happened that they had, my dad had made contact with people who would take my grandparents to a, a borderline cafe. And so my, uh, the man went with my dad to the uh, man's room and the woman went with my grandmother to the uh, ladies room. And on one side, my dad was uh, waiting and the other, uh, my sister was waiting. And that's how they brought my uh, grandparents in. They're walking out of the restaurant into Holland. And then they came, when we were living in Tilburg, which is the southern part of Holland, after they stayed with us for a couple of weeks, I don't remember how long, my dad and I took them the same way to the Belgian border, where my dad had made arrangements that we would take them, and then it would be uh, a contact with somebody in Belgium. And that's when they uh, went into Belgium. So, and he went to Brussels. And I want, I know that I went to uh, visit him in August, 1939. And my dad was supposed to pick me up to bring me uh, back home on September 1st. And that's when the war broke out and uh, all the borders were closed. And I was so happy. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with my grandparents whom I adored. So, but then the next day my dad came. So before we go further, can you tell us about your grandparents who you adored? What were they like? Can you talk about their, their personalities? What do you remember about them? And were these your mother's parents or your father's parents? Uh, my mother's parents. I never met my uh, father's parents because his, fa his father died when he was three and his mother died when he was 16. So he basically was a, an orphan. He was the youngest of seven children. And I only met uh, one of his uh, brothers, the one who was right above, above age wise above him. The other uh, three of them uh, got killed during World War I, or the, actually two got uh, killed during World War I. And uh, the th third one died of uh, injuries he uh, got during the, 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 the battle. And his oldest brother, who was 25 years older than my dad, he got killed during World War II in Warsaw. And I met some of his children, but go into Mishpuruki, that's a little kind of, kind of confusing for most people got killed anyway. So. So the war started in 1939 and your father brought you back to Munich? Or I mean, excuse me, to, to Tilburg. Right, you right. In, you were in Tilburg yes. um, after 38. Um, and then just going back a little bit again um, to 1938, do you remember when your family left Munich for Tilburg and what um, if that, any difficulties, what that process was like to leave? Oh, no, 
no, no, we were totally legal. We didn't go illegally over the border, no. But still, because we were Jewish, they gave us such a hard time, you wouldn't believe it. And, uh, but my sister and I managed to uh, smuggle in uh, our favorite bird. My mother didn't believe that we did that. So, but no, we, they stopped us and they separated my mother, my sister and me, and we each were, uh, the, and I don't know how, what my mother and my sister happened to, but I don't mind. She I said, made me undress and um, made sure that I had nothing hidden in bodily uh, cavities. And uh, I was ready to kill her. And then my silent wish has always been to find her, to uh, skin her alive. Then later on, I changed my mind. I was too good for her. I wanted to kill some other way. <laughs> and uh, the customs gave us a ter gave my mother a terrible time because she had a rat tail uh, um, uh, comb, and they used that to uh, uh, go through all the, the tubes, the toothpaste, creams, and everything. And most of them, they just squirted, squirted out of it again. And I thought, they, I hope they get all over their clothes. I was furious, but couldn't say anything. But when they finally uh, decided, well, there was nothing they were trying to do illegal. So we to open it, go across, go across. And that's where my dad was waiting for us. We were not illegal, but we were just called, called going home. Thank you. I just want to pull up the map here for our audience. So this is Munich, and Tilburg is about. You see, there. no, the red border is for uh, uh, Holland and Belgium. And then this. No, you see, no. Of Tilburg. Uh, that is Eindhoven. You see Eindhoven, and then you go a little bit further. Yeah. Right. Tilburg is right here. Yeah, yeah, that is Tilburg. And um, in 1939, the borders were a little different in Europe, but um, just wanted to just give um, the audience uh, this visual. Now, you said the borders were closed after 1939. No, so was it hard? After the uh, Kristallnacht. Right, right, but after oh, no, 39. It was after September 1st when the war broke out. They closed all the borders. Right. So when that, exactly. So in that case, was it difficult to get back to Tilburg from Brussels where you were visiting your grandparents? Yes, but my dad came and he brought the uh, proof that I had to go to school, so that I belonged there, so they could go back. Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940. What was that eight months like when you were living in Tilburg, Netherlands with your family before um, the invasion of the Netherlands? Well, number one, I was a terrible tomboy. So I was always uh, climbing trees, climbing houses, doing things you're not supposed to do. And also for all of my life, my eyes and uh, ears were places where they were not supposed to be. And I picked up an awful lot of information, which always put me in good standing. And I just, you know, there was nothing special. I uh, was supposed to go to school and I thought the kids were all stupid because as far as I was concerned, when you go to school, you have to know how to read and write. And those kids didn't know that. And I was a ferocious reader. By the time I was uh, six or seven, I had read all the children's books already. And I grew up in a house with books, magazines, and newspapers. So the reading was my forte. So I asked her, when I was about eight or nine, I asked my dad, can I read some, some of your books? I said, go ahead. And the ways that I learned that later when I had children, you let your children read whatever they want because when they get bored, they put it down anyway. And I remember the first book I read was Anna Karenina. I finished it from, I read it from beginning to end. And then I asked my dad, what's the matter with all those Russian men? All they do is, ever, is cry. And his answer was, you read the book now, read it in 10 years, read it in 20 years, read it in 30 years. Every time you reread a book, you get something else out of it. 
boy, was it a wise lesson. Any kind of book. I've never have gotten a book, rid of a book because to me, a book is like a friend. You don't get rid of your friends. I'm still a ferocious reader. Thank you. So you read a lot in that, in that time. Um, and you were going to school and- I was supposed to go to school till they kicked me out because I asked too many questions. Do you remember what the final question was that got you kicked out of school? No, what actually happened the first grade I remember was a woman and she was tall and beautiful and her name was Petite and I thought it was hilarious. So, so I was laughing and I was reading and writing and the kids couldn't, didn't learn and well, they were stupid, I was bored to tears. So that's when I had to leave. In second grade and third grade, before I, I realized that the person in front of the class is somebody who answers your questions. And I was full of questions. And that's what me kicked out of the class. And the principal of the school said to me, said, don't talk back. Don't ask questions. Just come. Here is your desk. Here is your work. You can do what you want. Later on, he was the guy who took us in for, for hiding our first hiding place. So uh, thank you. And we'll. Um, we'll get to that part of your story shortly. It, this time, though, what languages did you speak? Oh, I spoke the Dutch, German. I spoke a little bit of Yiddish. Because whenever my grandparents wanted to say something that they didn't want my sister or me to understand, they would speak Yiddish. So that's how we learned Yiddish. So when you lived in the Netherlands, it was um, it, when you first got there and the late 38, it was not, um, there was no issue because you were, you spoke, spoke Dutch already. Well, um, we uh, went to a small town for where my dad was working because the, the house wasn't finished building yet. That's why we were staying in Germany with my grandparents. And we uh, stayed in Dongen, D-O-N-G-E-N, which is well known in the shoe industry. And my dad was in the, in the shoe industry. So uh, I managed, uh, then I found, uh, then I realized that we had already been deprived of uh, certain foods or something like that. As to, although we were very fortunate, uh, where we, in the building where we lived, uh, the owner of the building had a son who was quote unquote, a Nazi member, but he only joined, he came up and told us he joined the party so his father would not lose the business. And I, it wasn't until much, much later until we had left today that I understood that he was the one who saw too that we had all the food and everything what we needed. If you want to know about the good Nazi, he was one of them. Thank you. So in May 1940, Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands. And what happened? Um, you were, were you already... Uh, so were you no longer in school at that time because you... no 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 I was in school okay so you got like, kicked out of, so you got kicked out of school a little later no, I didn't get school class kicked out of school I was kicked out of the class oh okay but the principal always uh, took care of me I just I wasn't uh, welcome in the class because I asked too many questions and I made all the other kids look stupid which they were anyway <laughs> So um, then when, what happened? When, how did your life change after Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands? On May 10th, uh, the, we lived on the outskirts of the city. There was across the street from there was a farmer. And he came back from milking his cows in the field. It must have been about four or five o'clock in the morning or something like that. And he called out, well, he used it, I didn't say the Germans, he used a, a dirty word for it, and uh, have invaded us. He hated the Germans so badly, even before he ever met any of them, I, that I don't uh, figure out, couldn't figure out why he hated them so much, he did. And uh, that's how uh, my sister and I found out that we were invaded, and my dad immediately joined the army. And we were, like I said, we were living in the outskirts of the city and there were a lot of water canals around us. And then uh, 
within uh, 24 hours, we were told to evacuate because we are going to blow up all the bridges, the railroad bridges, the shipping bridges, and everything was going to be blown up. And so uh, Holland also had a contract with France that if ever Holland gets in, uh, attacked, they uh, France would come to their aid. Well, we were attacked and France came to our aid. That meant that they were walking through Belgium. They didn't even have enough trucks to come. They were still using their old uniform, which were moth-eaten. They still had their old muskets with the, the, the leather uh, straps for over the shoulder were uh, probably broken and they just had a piece of string to hold it in place. That was the French army that came to defend us. And uh, we, in the middle of the night, we had to go from where we live to a, a place what they called uh, the Green Halls, I think, where, they are, where the, the vegetable uh, market was early in the morning. So, uh, because it was the only place big enough to hold everybody. And so we went there and we walked down the streets and they had taken cars. And the French, there was uh, the one was driving, the other one was sitting on the hood with the gun uh, heading up over the plane, the shoot like to uh, hit the uh, plane. I mean, that was ridiculous. I was laughing. I was laughing so hard. It was unbelievable. But the next morning, and we came there, and then the next morning, everybody had to go to the bathroom, of course. And there were so many people and not enough bathrooms. So my sister and I said, well, now we have to get out of this madhouse anyway. So we get out and around the corner, we found a place that had a little a store. It was a, like a cigar shop. And in front of it was a truck. So my sister said, okay, there's a truck. So we used that as the bathroom. And then, by that time, the people from the store opened up the store and they called us in and they offered us a cup of tea. And more people came out because they said they, they had to find a place where they could relieve themselves. And they, and well, the, owners of the store couldn't do that because they couldn't let all those st strangers come in. And so my sister and I said to, well, we used the truck that was standing here. Oh, they thought that was a wonderful idea. So they were all rushing outside to the truck and the truck took off. <laughs> and they blamed us for the fault. I didn't know that the truck was going to take off. But eventually we went back to our house. And uh, yeah, I, while I was waiting in the, at night, for my mother to come and uh, get get out of us, get us out of there. Uh, they had sat long up to that bridge, so they, and a big piece of the br uh, bridge came in through the um, uh, through the, uh, the door that came from the dining room into the yard, and it just knocked the wind out of me and, and threw me up against the wall. That's what I remember both that night, and I'm walking to the halls. And the next morning, uh, uh, have the truck uh, take off with the, the people. And we walked back. And we really had further no damage to the house. But some friends of, actually, she was a friend of my sister. And her parents, her father too, had immediately joined the army. And she, her mother and her grandmother lived much closer to the bridges. And they had a lot of damage to their house. So my mother took them in. So and eventually, uh, in Holland, that uh, succeeded, and uh, my parents, uh, my dad came back. Well, they had taken already the car, and the first thing my dad did is get rid of the telephone because she, he did not say that people are so stupid. They think as we have the telephone, you can call and whisper in the phone. And they can never know what you're talking about. Yeah, but then you saw the, the German cars driving through the streets with a tall antenna picking up the, the signals. So my dad got rid of the telephone so fast, he had no idea. He was in resistance immediately. So, and then the, the thing started with, uh, Limitation that you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that as a Jew. And I remember the one thing that really bothered me. There was a park, a sign up, no, uh, no dogs and Jews allowed. The dogs were even more important than the Jews. So, 
and that eventually drives so how did you and your family get into hiding uh that was one night i was already asleep uh a detective from the police knocked on my dad at the back door and told my dad, you better be gone by because by eight o'clock tomorrow morning, you're going to be picked up. So my dad told him to go to some place and ask him to keep the front door ajar. So at six o'clock, when that had a cur they had a curfew already by then, uh, but when a curfew broke, my sister and I were told to leave the house and go to that other family. And as we were leaving through the back door, the backyard and into the alley, I turned around and I looked at the house and said, well, never, I'll never see that life again. And I never did. And we walked to that uh, house and we went in. There. And at that point, we didn't know whether we would see my parents ever again. But we walked and we walked, the door was ajar. We slipped in. And then later in the day, in the morning, my parents came. They got out just in time before they uh, came to clean out the house. He took everything out of it. And uh, my mother stayed was after in a hiding place, but my dad who was in the resistance had false papers and he went to Amsterdam. So that was the last time I saw him for a long time till he came back from Auschwitz. And we had two uh, places. The first place, the man was very nice and the older children were nice. But the uh, female who was there, every time she would, every night she would tell me, I really ought to turn you in. And I said, a good night to you too. So even though my parents had brought food there and we had people who brought food, even though they did not know where we were, but they know that was the place to bring extra food that they had or extra coupons or everything. So I have to admit, I was hungry and I'm very good in breaking in. And they never caught me. I stole food. And then after about almost a year, the oldest son who was also in the resistance. And the main thing in for people who were in hiding was to get proper ID and the food coupons. Because the phony IDs were so phony at 10 meter distance, you could tell they were phony. I had, a, I was a good pickpocket, I pickpocket one for my sister. And uh, so that, that, that when we were already in hiding, yeah, there was so, I know, because it was not just Jews who were in hiding, there was people who were in the resistance, uh, the, the pilots that were downed, people who refused to go to forced labor camps. And so there were a lot of people who were in hiding and who were living on the false papers. And they had to get rid of the real papers. And they had planned, evidently, a raid on City Hall when it closed on Saturday at uh, 12 o'clock. They would go and uh, have a raid and get the uh, food coupons and some. Uh, IDs, and that was supposed to be at one o'clock. By three o'clock in the afternoon, somebody rings the doorbell from where we were in hiding, and the woman answers the door, and there was a man standing, said, he said, number one, your son is safe. He got away, but he was recognized. If you have anything in your house that can be in, incriminating, get rid of it, because the Nazis are on the way over. And I said, I have people here. He said, get rid of them. He said, I can't kick them out on the street. He said, I'll send somebody over who will take care of them. And so by four o'clock, it was winter. So it was already dusk, getting dark already. And so uh, the man came and he took us, because we lived until we even know there was an area I, we did not know. We all tried the uh, back alleys and back streets. So he took us to our house. And he knocked on the door and a man opened the door. And the, the, guy, who, the guy who was with us said, I have a family here need a uh, safe house. And he and opened the uh, right, said, come on in. And we walked in. 
And what they, they had, they had, were waiting for us was tea and paste of so whatever cake they had made. So uh, the next morning, that on Sunday morning, they eat the children and got an egg. Now, in the previous place we were, we, although we knew that a farmer brought eggs, we had gotten one egg between the three of us, scrambled egg, in a year. And there we got each an egg. Our eyes popped. And so the woman said to my mother, we have one rule here. The children get fed first. Whatever is left is divided equally amongst the adults. And it was really just to be supposed to be a safe house, but my mother begged them back to because they had had people before and had a very bad experience with them. But my mother just convinced them that uh, she would take us, and she did, and that became my family. So, well, not Michael, you were at that uh, uh, at my, uh, Laurie's house when we showed that, and there were pictures of my hiding family. Yes, yeah, so as a matter of fact, I can pull some of them up as well. Um, and how long were you living with them? A year. Yeah, yeah that was my hiding father. Oh, Mion, yes. That's my, 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 uh, my hiding father, my, my hiding mother, my hiding, and then her sister and her husband, who uh, towards the end of the war, when we were right behind the uh, uh, fighting lines. He was a butcher and he came and said, would you come with me to the fighting lines? And if I see uh, an animal being shot, I'm not taking a dead animal, but I have to see it being shot. Then I'll got him and take him. And my, uh, my uh, hiding father said, of course. They left and they came back with a cow and a horse. So at the end of the war, we, I thought before we had had no food, then we had nothing but meat. Because, but they did not know that we were in hiding there. And that was my hiding sister. And that's her husband. That's my sister. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to be in a hiding, what your daily life was like and what your thoughts were, if you remember what you might have been thinking the whole time or if you remember these things at all. You had to make absolutely sure that nobody could hear you. So you couldn't move, couldn't talk and uh, you couldn't get near a window to, uh, out of fear of uh, throwing a shadow. And uh, even we were sitting on a chair and that was just, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to slide off the chair onto a pail where they had rags in the bottom. So of course it didn't make any noise when you urinate or anything. And that was all, you, you never talked. We had nothing to read. There was nothing to do. And it was murder. Those long, long days. To me, it was the worst that I had nothing to read, but there was nothing to read. Because there we were in a working class family who had never had uh, used books as such, you know, and you couldn't expect them to all sudden go to a library and get books because that's very suspicious then. The only thing is that uh, I asked after the war, I asked my uh, hiding mother what made her decide to do what she did because she was endangering her, not her own life and her family life, but everybody's life. And she said, well, I didn't like what the Nazis were doing. And she was a very devout Catholic. And she went to confession and she told her father confessor, said, I don't know what to do. I can't stand it, what's going on. And the father, uh, the priest said to her, do what your heart tells you to do. Okay. So when she came back for the confession the next time, she said, father, I did what you told me to do. Said, what? He said, you told me to do what my heart told me to do. Said, so what did you do? Said, I have people in the house. Said, God bless you. And then he came to, and he gave me instruction in Catholic. So I was a very good Catholic. I knew my catechism better than most Catholics knew. I never converted. But uh, if needed, I could uh, pass as a Catholic. Thank you for sharing. 
So uh, when, um, when did things change for you and your family? At what point were you able, um, were you liberated? Were you able to come out of hiding um, during the course of, of the war and uh, well, we came 1945? Out, we came out of hiding very shortly because uh, after, uh, before, after the, they landed in Normandy, we got the daily update from, somehow my uh, hiding mother got the update information. And then they came into Holland and the southern part of Holland was liberated except Tilburg. Tilburg was surrounded because it was known for its industry, textile industry and the churches. And he said the churches are all full of uh, sharpshooters, which they were. So they never even bothered to come in. So they surrounded, they left us there and they surrounded us. And then eventually a, a scout went out across the, uh, the fighting lines and some come in and said, but well, most Germans have left there. There are still some in the uh, to uh, church towers, but that's it. And so th th we, and then we had uh, uh, the, the British, I don't know whether you're familiar, the British fought in North Africa, a tank division by the, called the Desert Rats. And one evening, the doorbell rings while we were ready to run into our hiding place. And my hiding father said, no, relax. You don't have to do that anymore. And then he opened the door and there were some, uh, we heard some voice, male voices, asked for us by name. And now you had to scrape us off the ceiling by then. And what happened was there were three desert rats. All three were Jewish. Two of them were in the same tank and the third one who was Hungarian had befriended himself as the other two Jewish guys. And the reason they came to us because the Hungarian fellow had a big stomach ulcer and he refused to go to the, uh, the doctor at the service because he knew he was gonna be sent home. And he said, I am going to drive my tank into Germany and preferably driving over some of them because he was not going to, and he had a terrible attack that night. And he was with those other two guys and they went to a pharmacy and they asked for some help and they started to talk and they asked her the, whether she knew about any Jewish people. And they said, I don't, but I know who, know, who knows. And she sent them to the man who got us that address. And that's how they knew our name and knew where to come. Oh. But I will never forget that feeling when they called us, asked for us by name. It was a horrible feeling. But eventually I had to get out because first of all, I, my legs were totally atrophied and I needed shoes which I had outgrown. And I had a very wide foot where my sister had a very narrow foot so I couldn't wear her shoes. And so I had to get a pair of shoes somehow. And I had to get, uh, I want to get a warm meal at least once a day. So I, and being a scout, and then the scouts were declared by the Germans as be a, a political party, in which case they were right, because of the, uh, the Boy Scouts especially, they would go out at daytime and signal uh, pilots with arm signals, and at night with flashlights. So they, they got, most of them got caught and killed, but uh, that's when the uh, scouts had to stop them moving, they were declared a political party. But we also, the last meeting we had, they said that if after the liberation medical, you look for the soldiers for the French lily, that's a pin, a small pin, they have on their upper left lapel uh, pocket. You can ask them what to do, for the, because they know what the, the scouts were supposed to do. And I, that's what I did. And so uh, I lied about my age. So what else is new? I lied so much. So I got that, uh, a warm meal a day and I got a pair of shoes. So. Can you talk about the process of readjusting after liberation, the war ended, um, what it was like for you and your sister and your parents to readjust and to start a new life? 
Well, I don't know about my sister and my mother. My dad was in Auschwitz, so he came back quite uh, quite a bit later. And uh, even then, how long do you have to know that the school system at that time, that if you wanted to go to college, you had to go through a college prep school. Most kids did not go into a college prep school. They went just to advanced uh, elementary school or a more advanced elementary school. There was different stages. No, I was going to go to college. I had never been in school yet, but I was going to go to college. So after the liberation, I went, there were three college prep schools in Tilburg. Two were for the Catholics, one boy and one girl, and then one, one public one. So I went to the public one and I talked to the principal and I told him that I had been in hiding and I wanted to get, uh, go to the school there now so I could prepare for college. And he said, well, if you bring me your sixth grade, uh, a report card will talk. And I thought, my God, that idiot didn't hear a word I said. So I start, told him the same story again. And I got the same answer. And by then I let loose. And what I said, I knew that I could never, ever go to that school. Of course, I called them flat out, I'm a complete idiot. And then I went to the Catholic girls' school, which was instead of five years, it was six years because they taught Greek and Latin. And so I told her that what I had done. And she said to me, I said, I don't condone what you did, but I fully understand it. And of course, you're welcome here. But there's only one thing. I don't want you to start in the first year when the kids come from elementary school, they're babies. You have had already a life behind you. Start the second year. He said, my God, I've never been to school. What do you want from me? That he, don't worry. We, the nuns, will help you. And I have to admit, those nuns were fabulous. They really were so helpful, so grateful. But I had to drop out of school after a couple of years because I was being ostracized by the children because I was not Catholic. So I couldn't come to the house. I couldn't be friends. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Well, I've been ostracized enough. That was it. And so, and that time you could do what I did what you can't do now anymore. You can study by yourself and start at do the uh, high, at a college prep, uh, prep school co uh, exam, but uh, through the government, which I did, and it worked. Then, I, just to happen, I got into with a professor from the college. He had a group uh, organized a group of ten. <laughs> I was the only Jew. The rest was uh, uh, they, they were from. Uh, um, and the nation the Jap camps. People really are not, don't realize how terrible those Jap camps were. But, uh, and he said, I have a group of 10 and I'll split you. One group of five goes to one group of classes and the other one goes to the other. And you exchange at night, you exchange notes and study together. And there's only one thing I tell you, if there's an exam and if any one of them of you gets below a, a B, even a B minus, you're out. We started out with 10, we ended up with nine. So that's how we got our college. Thank you for sharing. At this point, um, we have some questions from the audience, so I will start to ask. And again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box on Zoom or those watching on Facebook, you can type your questions in the comments. First question we have, uh, when did you come to the United States? February 1956. And did your family all come together? No, my sister was here already, and I was being brought over by the John Hopkins University. Did your father ever talk about Auschwitz and how he survived? As little as possible. My dad was not a talker, no. He only knows that he was uh, liberated by the Russians. And because he was an engineer and he spoke uh, the, the, the language, they took him in further and further into Russia till he finally one day, he woke up saying, no, 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 I have to get out of here. So he somehow he managed to get a discharge slip and then he stole a blanket and a sausage and a bottle of vodka and he started walking with the West.
so aside from that, he never really talked about his not experience. That, no. not, not that to me. At least not to you. When did your parents pass away? My dad passed away in 94. My mother passed away in 99. And my sister passed away a year ago. Thank you. Do you talk to other Holocaust survivors? Are you, do you have relationships with other survivors? And if so, how did yes. that start? But we don't sit around and talk about it. No, the only thing is that the most people that uh, would have the, the most thing I have to come with some of the survivors that we, uh, families who took us in and took care of us became our family and we are still in touch with them. So. Thank you. And actually, as a follow-up question, um, how often have you returned to um, to the Netherlands to visit um, your hiding family? Oh, I didn't go back to visit my hiding family per se. I went back to see my parents. So as long as they were alive, I would go once or twice a year. And when I was there, of course, I would get together with my hiding family. And one year, my parents were already gone. We were in Holland visiting some friends and my youngest daughter who had a I don't remember now whether they already are officially engaged or not but anyway she wanted them to meet her hide my hiding family and she introduced them to them so because uh, you know that uh, I was among the uh, one uh, well, that's the, my hiding family part of it. And you know, approximately what year was th this taken? Mm. Oh, what, let me see. Looking at them. Um, in the back it says Ger's daughter, but Kerry never had, a, had any children. So she was Willie's daughter. Uh, oh God, so 94. Uh, it in the late eight, must have been in the eighties, late eighties, maybe early nineties. I really don't remember. Thank you. Can you please share with us about your career in the United States and what you did when you came when you came here? And did you come to Los Angeles right away? No, I. Like I said, I was being brought over by the Johns Hopkins University for my for my uh, cancer research work, and uh, the guy who was the head of the lab here, he was the head of all the laboratories in the uh, in the world. And once a year, he would uh, he and his wife would go around from lab to lab to uh, <clears throat> compare to what progress has been made and and what is going to be in the next step to go, and. Uh, I won't go into the details what happened to me, but he f met me then and I could do some work that his wife had, had been able to do, but never been able to progress because none of the uh, workers at the, the hospital at the, um, Johns Hopkins uh, knew what to, uh, how to do it. And so he said to me, uh, I want you to come and work for me. He said, sure, that takes an age away, you know, for uh, my quarter. To come in, said, forget it. You come out of visitor, be took care of your papers. Oh, excuse me. And so uh, then that my dad went for business, and it was my uh, nephew's second birthday, and I hadn't seen my sister in years. He said, well, a good time to go and visit my sister. So I, that's when I came down. That was uh, February uh, 50, uh, 56, was my nephew's uh, second birthday that we came. And um, so I've stayed there for a while and visited. Then I went to uh, Baltimore and he introduced me to the group. And I knew that from the very beginning, I just took one look at that group and said, they are not going to accept me. Even though they knew that there was a promotion coming and offering, I was younger than any of them. And one of them even had the audacity to say to me, oh, you don't speak English. He said, yes, I speak English, you speak American. And I thought that Dr. Guy, the head of the department, almost died laughing. The, 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 
well, those people were so stupid, they didn't know the difference. In those days, there was not, not the exchange of traveling, television, movies, and so Now there's much uh, less of a difference between the two languages. They understand most of it. Thank you for but, sharing. So, but then, and also he said to me, you know, I understand, I said, well, I, I could feel the hostility, said, you know, because I don't want you to go back to Holland. If you stay in the United States, where would you go? He said, well, I have a sister in, uh, in Chicago. I would go to Chicago. I said, okay. And he uh, lets me sitting there for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and he comes back, said, okay, it's all set. Look at them, the University of Chicago is waiting for you. So they transferred everything to the University of Chicago. And so was your, what was your title? Were you a researcher, a science, uh, what was your title? I didn't go for a title, I didn't know. Yeah, I was a researcher and I was a scientist, whatever. <laughs> I did my work. Thank you. Can you talk about um, starting a family? Pardon me? Um, when did you start a family? Was it in, in uh, Los Angeles or when? Um... It was in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. So you met um, your husband in Chicago? Yes, he was a Chicagoan. So he was native, native of Chicago. Yeah. Thank you so much. And can you please share with the audience um, how many children you have? I have two daughters. One is a physician, the other one is an attorney. I want to be well protected. <laughs> Thank you. Um, were the members of your hiding family um, listed in Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations? They did not want it. We wanted to do it, and they had absolutely refused to participate in it. Said he, we didn't do that to get a plaque or a name or anything. We did it because we wanted to. And we were left with wonderful friends. And even with the Show Foundation, they would not give her uh, their uh, testimony. So that's not what we did. They said, uh, the grandchildren know about it, and that's all that matters. So, so uh, since they didn't really want to talk about it um, in that sort of setting, but you shared your story with students on a regular basis um, for several years, uh, um, which is actually sharing their story. It's sharing what they did for you. What is your goal in sharing this story, particularly with students? I know you work a lot with um, with students over the years, with the younger generations. Why do you? Why is it important for you to share this story and their story and what they did for you? Well, the first thing I learned from the students: too much has happened in the last 70, 75 years. You can't teach it anymore. There's so much going on. They cannot possibly, the, I was shocked that the majority of the kids, even teachers didn't know about the, the jab camps. They knew very little about it. And I say, no, no matter what, you always can learn. So I, a lot of the survivors, when they came and gave the talk, they had, this, it was like a story. They had made a book a little of it, of all the stories and had pictures and so. I never went that way. I started out to introduce myself and tell me something about. Then I would go by the vibes I got from the audience. And I always tried to engage them to have their brain working, thinking, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? What do they want to do? What do they want to accomplish in life? And uh, I must have been very successful because I got, even from one of the uh, principals, I got the recommendation that that was so great that he used it, my line of uh, in introduction as the, their study lines. So, and I was at one school, they were talking about the Japs, and don't, uh, excuse me when I say Japs, because to me, the Japs is the Japanese and the Japs, like the Germans and the Nazis. So when I said Japs, I mean like the Nazis. And she did not, her mother, she said, was Malay, a Malaysian. But she said, her mother never would talk. And after I talked to her and I explained what happened, so she called me a couple of weeks later, she called me and said, 
Well, thank you so much, Shelley. That was the first time my mother and I talked together and cried together. Of course, the mother didn't want to tell the daughter. So, you know, she didn't want to hurt her, and the daughter didn't know. So I told them. Because they didn't have uh, desk camps like uh, the, the Nazis had. I don't know anything about the men's camp. That I don't, because I didn't know any men. But the women, the Japanese men have no respect for women. And if they came to the camps and the women didn't bow deep enough, they would just beat them to death. There was never enough food. There was no medicine and the malaria was rampant. So they died like flies. A lot of people died and the people are not even aware of it. So. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, how did Johns Hopkins University find you? How did, and how did they, I know they sponsored you, but um, how did you connect with them? How many hours do you have? <laughs> well, we have all day. <laughs> well, uh, that's because the, from Johns Hopkins, he was the, he and his wife traveled, that, like I said before, around the world, the different laboratories. There were seven laboratories all over the world where they did the same kind of uh, research and see what they could accomplish in cancer research. And that was in the early days that really cancer was a death and uh, notice, you know. And... Uh, I got, I really was not interested in it. I was going into biochemistry, but my, uh, one of my professors, he didn't tell me anything. He just took me on, the, on his arm and took me over there and said, you are the new head of the department. He said, I don't know anything about cancer. He said, you learn. And then later on, I found out that I was put in the place while the woman who wasn't judged, who was a PhD in biology and hated medicine, was on vacation. When she came back, she had, well, she wasn't fired from a job, but she was put in a, t a tiny little room that was her room. She couldn't do all the work and the research anymore, and she hated my guts, for which I did not blame her. I mean, what a way to uh, be replaced. And so, uh, and, I, and I got uh, along very well with all the different department heads, like the histology and uh, the micro, uh, uh, microbiology and everything. And she hated everything that was medicine. So uh, then one day, uh, it must have been well over a year, there was a meeting. I didn't know about that. And I heard later that they had a meeting with the doctor from Johns Hopkins and he was there and he uh, asked that all the, the different heads of the department gave reports of what they had done. And then that female got up and she started reporting on my uh, work, uh, my work. And two other departments has got up and said, oh no, you, you didn't do that. Ruth was, that's Ruth's work. You are a liar. And what did they let her in, uh, in public? And so he said, so, so where's that Ruth, where is she? He said, well, she's not here. She probably doesn't even know you're here. He said, I want to meet her, okay? So after the meeting, they were bringing her over. And sure enough, I had never, she had never told me that they had a meeting. I didn't know anything about it. So that's how I met that head of the Johns Hopkins. And he liked the work I'd done. And that was the work that his uh, wife was also trying to uh, pursue, but couldn't because uh, uh, the, nobody at the, her lab uh, could carry on while she was gone. And that's when he said, uh, I want you to come to the uh, United States. So. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us this afternoon. And um, we had people watching um, from Illinois and from Portugal. Um, I wanted to let you know. And so you've reached a wide audience today. And it was such a, an honor and pleasure to welcome you for your first Zoom talk. I know you've um, done this several times in person, and I'm glad you're um, we could do this on Zoom and we could record it to save for future generations and to be able to send out to anyone um, who wants to listen to your story. And again, on behalf of the museum, thank you so much for the work that you have done for the last several years, speaking to students at all of our educational programs. Um, we're so happy to have you as a part of our community. 
And if there's anything you'd like to say to conclude, um, please feel free. You know, anything you'd like people to take away from learning your story. Not just my story, but my attitude has always been to the students. Don't ever take no for an answer. If you make up your mind to do it, you can do it. If it's not one way, there's another way. There's always ways you can do and get things done properly and get stories out and get people convinced what you have to tell them. And that was always my message to all the students. Don't take no for an answer. Prove yourself. Well, thank you so much again for sharing with us this afternoon. Thank you to our audience for um, your attention and for your questions. And uh, our hope is that people will be passing this story along with others and your message along as well. So, and I know they will, we can count on you. Thank you so much, everybody. Wishing you a happy, healthy, and safe weekend ahead. And uh, we hope to see everybody relatively soon in person at the museum. But in the meantime, we will be continuing. We hope, Ruth, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon in person. Um, but we will be continuing our virtual programs as well. So if you can follow our website, we have Survivor Talks um, this month on Thursdays at 11. Next month in July, they will be on Fridays. So um, please feel free to keep tuning in to those, to our other programs. And thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Ruth, for sharing with us and for being with us, for being our honored guest this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having me.